all the Philistines' faith was in these material things that they could see, and the second that that protection, that illusion of protection goes away, and they see their champion, who had the best armor and the best weapons, get taken out by one little kid with a rock, all of a sudden they understand, oh man, that trust that we had put in all of that stuff is not real reliable. They probably wouldn't have articulated it that way, but that's what their instincts are telling them, and they're right. They put their faith in the wrong thing, and now they realize it. Hey there, fellow tacticians. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that little notification bell, because the more likes and subscriptions I get, the more people see my conservative content, which will make America a better place, and angers the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report, we will be continuing the series that we've been doing in 1 Samuel. And this is it. This is what we've been building to these many weeks where we're talking about Goliath. This is the big battle which takes place in 1 Samuel 17, verses 48 through 49, where it says, Then it happened when the Philistine rose and came and drew near to meet David that David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand into his bag and took from it a stone, and slung it, and struck the Philistine on his forehead. And the stone sank into his forehead, so that he fell on his face to the ground. So, first of all, this is history's first critical hit. So, if you're an RPG gamer like me, you know what that means. It's just having to hit in the right spot, and then the giant comes tumbling down. So... You know, David's courage that we've been talking about going into battle with nothing but a slingshot, not needing armor, not needing a sword, relying on God as the one that is going to thrust him to victory in this battle wound up working out quite well for him. And I think it's important to note, all David needed was a rock. That's it. God has a habit of doing the extraordinary with the ordinary. Think about this. At the time of the Exodus, Egypt was the most powerful country on planet Earth. It would have been like Rome at the height of the Roman Empire, or the British Empire in the 15 and 1600s, or America is today. This is the most powerful country on Earth. God took it down with one dude and a stick. Literally a stick. And now... When Israel is faced with this overwhelming threat of the Philistines and this little, little tiny nation of God's people is confronted with a nine-foot giant, God sends a teenage boy and a rock. That's God's plan. And what's even more astounding is it actually works because God is God. And that was the point of this whole thing anyway. If you get anything else out of this, if you get any other message out of this lesson, you're doing it wrong. The whole thrust of this, this message, and there are other lessons you can learn from it, but ultimately all of those lessons ought to go back to, at some point, God is God. God is God. He can accomplish the impossible. He is limitless. He is omnipotent. Everything. He is the Almighty because He can take a 15-year-old with a slingshot, a little bit of leather, and a rock and take down a nine-foot giant warrior. Because that's who he is. He does the extraordinary with the ordinary. One of the things that we learn about Jesus Christ is that with the only description we have of what he looked like is that he was not particularly attractive. We know from the epistles that Jesus was not somebody that had wealth or status or anything. The only thing he had going for him is that God was on his side. And that's all David had on his side. And you know what? That's all they needed. They didn't need anything else. If David had gone into battle completely unarmed, God would have found a way for him to prevail then too. God could have struck Goliath down at any time. He didn't even need a person to go in. 
And so that's what's being illustrated here is that God does the he, he makes that which is impossible any other way possible. He is the X factor that takes things that otherwise could not be done and gets them done. And another message I think that it sends is that look at the weapon of choice here. Swords are crafted by men. It takes time. It takes hours. It takes years of experience. A seasoned swordsmith has learned from literally centuries of experience from people that have passed that knowledge down to make a good sword. So this is something that takes an incredible amount of effort on the human side of it. God used a rock to beat a guy with a big sword and a big spear and a big shield and a whole bunch of armor that a lot of people spend a lot of time making. See, rocks are made by God, not like swords. And yet somehow this sword, this thing that God made, triumphs over this thing that humans labored and worked over. And I like swords. I'm a swordsman. I collect them. I know how to use them. It's all something that interests me. But ultimately, I understand that that which is made by God is better. Now, obviously, if I get a choice of, of going into battle with a sword or a rock, I'm going to pick a sword. But the message that is being sent here is, if God makes it, it is adequate. You see, sometimes human beings fight and toil and work and slave, and they will create something that is very good, but it is still not the same as something that God made. I mean, look at artificial intelligence. We have been working nonstop for years trying to reach artificial intelligence, and we're probably not that far off. We may get there in a decade or two, maybe even sooner, who knows. But it's still something that we're trying to copy from God. Because of my job, I'm really into cameras. And it's so great that we have high-tech cameras that are relatively cheap now that you can watch something in, in 1080, uh, full high-def, that we have these high-def cameras that even normal people can afford. They're still not as good as the human eye. Think about it. The human eye, granted, it'll, it'll gain some wear and tear over the years, and it'll, you, know, you may need a doctor to help keep it sustained, but do you know of any other camera that sees in perfect HD you know, for 80 years, and is self-cleaning, it comes with its own lens cover. I mean, everything that human beings make is just trying to imitate something that God already did. God's creations are better. And that's one thing that is being put on display here as well. It's a tangential thing, but I think it's also important. And we'll see the results of this battle as well in 1 Samuel 17, verses 50 through 51. Thus David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. And he struck the Philistine and killed him, but there was no sword in David's hand. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off the head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. You know how embarrassing it is to get killed with your own sword? I just mentioned that I've studied sword play a little bit. I'm, you know, not an expert or anything like that. And if I had somebody that really knew what they were doing, I'd probably get myself killed. But the point is, I've studied it a little bit. Believe me when I tell you, the most shameful thing that can happen to you as a swordsman is to die by your own blade. Because that means either you were so unskilled that somebody was able to remove your sword from you, take it away from you, or to position their own sword in such a way that they made your own blade hurt you which is more of a testament to your incompetence than their skill. And so, because of that, Goliath not only dies, but he dies in basically the most embarrassing way possible. First, he gets knocked out by a, you know, a little kid with a slingshot, and then after that humiliation, the way that he actually dies is that same kid goes and picks up his sword and cuts his head off with it. This is by far the most embarrassing way that a warrior, somebody who prides himself as being skilled with a sword, can possibly die. And by the way, this is not only applies to swords and doesn't only apply to Goliath. We see this happen in other places in the scripture as well. Think about, for example, the hanging gallows. If you know anything about the story of Haman, 
He had a gigantic 50-foot-tall gallow built for Mordecai because he wanted to kill God's people. And spoiler alert for a story that's now several thousand years old, what winds up happening to Haman is that Esther, the queen, turns against him, and he winds up hanging on the gallows that he himself made. He made the gallows for his enemies, and what wound up happening is he got hung on his own gallows. This happens in Egypt, too. The pride of Egypt was the Nile. And what's the first thing God does when he sends Moses to free his people? Turns it into blood and makes it useless. In fact, makes it worse than useless. He actually makes it a blight on the land. Because it stinks, and then eventually the frogs come up out of it, and that becomes another plague. Then you've got, you know, mice, or mice, lice, lice and flies flying around. The thing that was their saving grace, the pride of Egypt, the Nile River, became the source of their demise. And there's other Bible stories I could allude to, but you get the idea. God uses people's own sword against them when they're wicked and refuse to do what he asks them to over and over again because it's an embarrassing way for them to meet their end, and it also shows his own superiority. He's saying, I am God, and all of the stuff that you're using, all of the stuff that's benefiting you, eventually I made it. Like, even the sword, even though I'm sure it was crafted by some kind of Philistine blacksmith, well, God made the metal. God created iron and carbon and all the other things that you need to make a sword. And so, eventually, no matter how good the craftsmanship is, God's responsible for it at some point. And when you try to use the things that God has blessed you with to hurt other people, normally what he does is he turns that blessing around on you. And that's what we're seeing here in this particular passage. One other point that I wanted to make as well is that why did the Philistines all run away when one guy got killed? They still have the advantage. They still have a great big army. Why are they so scared of this? Because the Philistines put their trust in their weapons and armor just like Goliath did. Goliath's trust was not in God. It was in his size, his muscle, and his armor and his weapons. But just like David has just illustrated in the verse that we looked at last week, or Tuesday, his faith was in the living God. All the Philistines' faith was in these material things that they could see, and the second that that protection, that illusion of protection goes away, and they see their champion, who had the best armor and the best weapons, get taken out by one little kid with a rock, all of a sudden they understand... Oh, man, that trust that we had put in all of that stuff is not real reliable. They probably wouldn't have articulated it that way, but that's what their instincts are telling them, and they're right. They put their faith in the wrong thing, and now they realize it. Even though they probably don't understand all of the implications of it or wouldn't be able to explain why that is, their brains are telling them, you are not safe. And the reason you are not safe is because you put your faith in all these things that clearly didn't protect this guy. And so they justifiably now understand that David, with God at his side, is much scarier than a whole bunch of big guys with armor and swords. And finally, let's look at this last little passage on this battle. 1 Samuel 17, 52-54. The men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the slain Philistines lay along the way to Shariam, even to Gath and Ekron. The sons of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines and plundered their camps. Then David took the Philistines' head and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his, uh, he put his weapons in his tent. So, I do think it's actually pretty cool that David winds up taking Goliath's sword, and that actually comes into play later in a different story where he uses Goliath's sword again. But the thing that is so astounding about this is this isn't just a victory. The Bible is very clear to point out this is a total victory to the point that they're not only losing the battle, they even lose their camps. They're being driven back so far and so fast that all their stuff is left behind. The enemy camp is behind them open for Israel to plunder. And so they do. God has such a convincing, overwhelming victory, and it's all thanks to David. 
I mean, obviously, you go back further, it's all thanks to God, obviously. But God only needed to have one very brave person to stand up and say, I will stand up for what I believe in. I will stand up to defend God's name. And the second that he did, overwhelming victory. To the point to where the Philistines are terrified and the Israelites were emboldened. You see, if this thing had happened without David, maybe even if the Philistines weren't afraid, the Israelites had become emboldened enough that they would have won the battle anyway. That's a possibility. I don't know that for sure, because it's a what-if situation. But the thing is, it took one person to encourage everybody else. Only one. So when God's people aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing, when you look around and you see God's people are afraid, or they're engaged in things they should not be engaged in, or they're just not acting the way that God would want them to act, and you're like, this is terrible. Keep in mind that God only needs one person to fix that. You can be that person. Will it be scary and uncomfortable? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's going to be. I mean, that's what happened with David. He had to face somebody that he, on paper, had no chance against. And yet that very same boldness is why we honor him even to this day, thousands of years after he's been dead. It's because he had the faith that inspired the people around him. God only needed one person to be bold and to step forward and say, even if nobody else is going to do it, I will stand for God. I will do what is right. And it led to an overwhelming victory and a whole bunch of people doing what God wanted them to do from the very beginning. It only takes one. Be that kind of person. Be like David and face the giants, and it will cause a victory. Maybe not an immediate victory, maybe not even a victory by the world's definition, but a victory nonetheless. Be the person that is willing to stand up for what God wants you to do. Other people are going to take notice, and most of the time, you're going to have some people follow as well. Stay the course, friends. <laughs> Hey, if you liked this video, then you should press the like button. I mean, that's literally what it's there for. If you liked the video but didn't hit the like button, then it's like getting great service but not tipping your waiter. Except liking is free, and so is subscribing and hitting the notification bell. So if you're enjoying my content but not liking my video, there's really only one explanation. It's because I'm black, isn't it?